marine ecosystems. Um, so this picture right here is in your textbook, and it's really important that you look at the different parts of the marine environment. Um, we're just going to go through the different um, life zones, and then we're going to talk about the human impacts on the marine ecosystems. So if you look at this picture, um, the marine ecosystem is broken down into three different life zones. We have the intertidal zone, which is this yellow little portion right here. Um, we have the benthic environment, the same as lakes and ponds. It's just the bottom portion of the marine ecosystem. And we also have the pelagic environment, which is basically the whole ocean here, which is broken down into the neuritic province as well as the oceanic province. Um, so we're going to start with the intertidal zone, which is this area right here in yellow. The intertidal zone you can think of is the area between high and low tide. So um, you know that, that tides happen due to the moon's gravitational pull. And so twice a day we're going to have high and low tides. And so the intertidal zone is just that area along the shoreline. You can think about it um, when you go to the beach. Maybe you put your chair in the intertidal zone and then the tides start to come in. So you have to pick up your chair and move it. Um, and that is basically the area for the intertidal zone. Um, if you look at the intertidal zone, like I said, it's the area between high and low tide, and the ones that we're familiar with here in Florida are sandy, beachy intertidal zones. Um, and for the most part, when we have sandy, beachy intertidal zones, um, the organisms that are able to survive here have adaptations such as burrowing down into the sand, for example, so different types of crabs, so that they're not taken away with the uh, tides or with the waves. Um, but there are other types of intertidal zones, and we can also have a rocky intertidal zone. And so this is something that um, you can see along a shoreline where you have organisms that have special adaptations um, in order to hold them down in place from um, being drawn out with the waves and the tides. So a lot of them require anchorage, and an example of that could be different types of mussels that are able to anchor themselves down onto the, the sand here for a rocky intertidal zone. Um, there's lots of light penetration um, for an intertidal zone. That's why it's biologically successful, um, because it's basically shallow water. Lots of nutrients in the intertidal zone, but like I said, because it's a stressful environment, whether it's a beach or a rocky intertidal zone, many of the marine organisms here require special adaptations to survive here. The next major zone here is called the pelagic environment, and this is really the shoreline out throughout the open ocean. And um, it has a major life zone here. You can see it says a euphotic zone. And this is just the top portion of the ocean. And you see that term photic there? You should think um, that light penetrates throughout this zone. And because we have light penetration, um, we'll have a lot of phytoplankton that are going to survive in the euphotic zone. So the euphotic zone, we're going to have lots of phytoplankton. And basically, they're the base of the marine food web. So that's the top portion of the ocean. The pelagic environment is broken down into the neuritic and the oceanic province. The neuritic province um, is basically the area of high tide, so it includes the intertidal zone here, you can see, out to the end of the continental shelf. So it's the area of high tide out to the end of the continental shelf. And I always think that I get neurotic in the neuritic, so I get nervous and scared because this is the area where you would go swimming and your feet are touching the bottom of the ocean all the way out to the continental shelf. That's a way that you can remember it. And um, some types of organisms that you would find here, um, many different types of plankton, so jellyfish and sea jellies are a type of plankton that we have. Remember that plankton are are free floating. Um, we'll also see some nectin that are consuming the plankton. So many nectin that are going to be eating the uh, the small zooplankton as well as the phytoplankton in this area. 
And um, that's mainly it for your neuritic. It's just the uh, high tide out to the end of the continental shelf. The other portion of the pelagic environment is known as the oceanic province. This is the largest part of the marine environment. So 70%, 75% of the ocean's water is going to be found in the oceanic province. It's basically the end of the continental shelf out to the next end of the other continental shelf. So it does not overlay the continental shelf because that's the neuritic province. Um, mostly cold temperatures, um, except for the euphotic zone, as we said before, because that's where light penetrates. So mostly cold temperatures, the deeper you go. Um, and uh, the deepest part, so if you do have organisms that have adapted to live deep down in the oceanic province, they have special adaptations that are going to be able to uh, make them survive. If you remember, we talked about um, your little Finding Nemo, the anglerfish that has that little light. That light is going to um, attract their prey and that's how they're going to be able to eat and survive. But a lot of the organisms down deep in the oceanic province, um, they're going to depend on what's called marine snow. And marine snow is just organic debris that falls from the top portion of the ocean. So it's the largest area of the ocean, like I said, 75% of the ocean water. It's also known as the deep sea. It's the least explored of the whole part of the ocean. And um, other than your um, anglerfish, another type of animal that you would find down here would be the giant squid, which is pretty interesting. Um, the giant squid is very large. Um, can be 58 feet, including its tentacles. Um, and in 2012, it was first filmed in its natural habitat ocean. Um, and so they in the oceanic province. The next portion of the marine ecosystems is going to be the benthic environment. So remember, just like lakes and ponds, the benthic environment is referring to the bottom portion of the ocean. So we have um, the deep portions of the benthic environment, which include the baffle zone. It's not written here, but between 200 and 4,000 meters deep, this whole zone right here along the bottom of the ocean is called the baffle zone. Between 4,000 and 6,000 meters deep, it's called the abyssal zone. And then between 6,000 meters all the way to the deepest part of the ocean, so thinking the Mariana Trench there, um, that's called the Hadal Zone. So these are three portions of the benthic environment that are very deep, but there's not a lot of productivity here, as you can imagine, because there's no photosynthesis and no light penetration. So we're going to focus on the photic benthic environment. And photic obviously means light. And so some of the major um, grasses that you'll see here, um, some major sea grasses in the photic environment um, would be like manatee grass, especially in the tropics, turtle grass, eel grass in temperate regions. But as you can see here, these grasses are able to survive in salt water, um, not very deep in the ocean because you're, you need, they need light penetration in order for them to photosynthesize. Um, a lot of them are flowering plants and um, they provide food for the herbivores in the marine environment. So manatees would eat manatee grass as well as turtle grass in the tropical environments. And whatever grasses are not consumed by the herbivores are, are going to be um, decomposed by bacteria uh, at the bottom of the ocean and then nutrients will be recycled. Um, Another part of the photic benthic environment includes the kelp forests. And kelp is the largest brown algae, so it's actually a protist. And you can see how it's kind of held down here to the bottom of the ocean by a hold fast. And kelp forests actually rival coral reefs for biodiversity, so lots of biodiversity. They're found mostly in temperate regions, so not necessarily in the tropics. Um, and they're very, very tall almost looks like trees um, or forests in the ocean. So they're very tall, 
light's able to penetrate because they're, they need to go through photosynthesis. Um, they provide food for the community. Um, so all the animals that live within the kelp forest, which includes sponges, tube worms, fishes, sea otters, um, they all depend on the, the food here or the, the um, kelp for food. And then um, our primary consumers will just eat those uh, um, produce or the prim secondary consumers, excuse me, will eat the primary consumers. Um, and so they'll be able to sustain life by that. Um, so yeah, they're very high in biodiversity. And like I said, they rival coral reefs. And so they're in the photic benthic environment. And then the last, um, number three here, are coral reefs. Um, you can see on this map here that coral reefs are mainly located in the tropics. So you can see the equator here. And these little red dots here are signifying coral reefs. Um, the outer shell of coral reefs are made of calcium carbonate. They are living organisms. Um, and they're found in shallow water because they do require a symbiotic relationship with protists called zooxanthellae. Um, so the zooxanthellae uh, go through photosynthesis and that's why they need to be in shallow waters. Um, the zooxanthellae are single-celled protists that have a mutualistic relationship with the corals. So during the daytime when it's sunny out and they have lots of light penetration, the zooxanthellae are going to photosynthesize and produce glucose. That glucose will be given to the coral itself. And then at nighttime when there's no light available, the corals have uh, many times these tentacles that are going to capture zooplankton. And so they're going to be able to consume the zooplankton. And so they'll provide some of that energy to the zooxanthellae. So they have a mutualistic relationship. Um, and we have three main types of corals. The most common, let's see the next slide. that doesn't affect this okay so um, the three main types well we have the fringing reef this is the most common type of coral reef you can see that this coral reef actually um, is attached to our shoreline so here's the reef and it goes out to sea so it says here is near shore and separated from land by low water so this is the most common here's a picture of one in Israel The next reef is called an atoll reef. Again, I'm hoping my computer is uh, working with me here. Okay. 